Hi folks, Matt Easton here. Now, um, I recently, in fact, I think yesterday, day before, put up a video talking about late period Warhammers. As noted, these were used, in fact, all over Europe um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, basically anywhere that armour was still used. That's not to say that they're only useful against armoured opponents. Of course, you could use it against an unarmoured opponent as well. Qu quite clearly, it's, it's a, a, a moderately heavy, spiky, hitty object um, that you could hit anyone or anyone anything with. In the past I have spoken, uh, this is a bit of a tangent to the main video, but in the past I have spoken about the effectiveness of these compared to swords against unarmoured opponents. And yes, I would agree that against an unarmoured opponent, a sword is generally speaking a better weapon. It's faster, longer, it's sharp for its entire length, you can cut or thrust with it. It's easier to wound um, an opponent who's unarmoured or, or at least wearing you know clothes or maybe bits of armour than uh, or only a few bits of armour um, than with something like this which is essentially a bit slower a bit shorter but this is more specialised to fighting armoured opponents now back onto the main track of the video so um, I spoke about these and I showed two examples mo both made by Fabrice uh, in France in Burgundy specifically and uh, Fabrice Cognon and I'll put again I'll put the link underneath this video to his um, manufacturing sales page and um, and he does make anything by the way uh, he does have in stock items but mostly he, I believe he makes um, just bespoke to order items and anyway so these are both more or less similar types of Warhammer um, both I believe 17th century uh, based on 17th century originals might be late 16th century it's not my uh, period of, of greatest specialization but certainly these were still in use in the 17th century. Um, but when I showed these, a number of questions came up and I thought, you know, I could, I could, much like my five questions thing, I could kind of address those questions, but I don't have, before I go on, I, I will say I don't have answers to all of those questions. In fact, probably don't even have answers to most of them. But let's just have a look. So I'll just have one at a time. They're both fundamentally similar um, things. And so one of the questions that came up is, why would you only have a flat face on the hammer rather than one having like a coronet or projections or a pyramid in the center or this kind of stuff? Well, firstly, you have to remember this is a 17th century uh, or at least late 16th century, perhaps, um, Warhammer. It is not uh, 15th century polax, okay? So 15th century polaxes were of their time and they were for a specific type of context and most of the people that a 15th century polax would hit would be armoured to some extent. 17th century, completely different situation. In the 17th century, a lot of the soldiers you might hit with this, and especially the ones that you might hit with the non-spiky side, so if we're using that mostly against armoured opponents to get into gaps between armour, or in some cases even try and drive the point through armour, um, if you're fighting the other types of people, the musketeers, the pikemen, these type, uh, types of people, they might have no armour at all or they might just have a helmet or if they're very lucky or unlucky depending how you look at it, they might have to wear um, a breastplate with tassets and a helmet. Okay, that'd be pretty much the, the most, for most of the period, the heaviest armoured infantry you might come up against. So if you're riding around on your horse, bearing in mind this is mostly used by horsemen, if you're riding around on your horse and you want to take a, a passing swiping shot uh, from your from horseback at someone uh, you know a pikeman who's looking the other direction for example don't ride straight towards a pike um, then you might think okay I'm coming up I'm gonna flip that around I'm gonna hit with the hammer end um, and uh, I, I'm gonna hit them and carry on passing now you could use a spike you could use the hammer yes you could use either however using the hammer end you run no risk whatsoever of it getting stuck and really what you're doing is you're hitting them with a lump, with a weight on a stick. Um, and whether that has spiky projections or not, bear in mind it's a fairly small head as well. So if you hit someone in the skull with that, it's going to break their skull. You don't need spiky projection, projections on it to do that. Indeed, if you hit them in the body, or shoulder, neck, whatever, face, uh, chest, sternum, all of these kind of aiming for bony areas, areas generally, um, then that's going to have the desired effect with the smooth face on it. You don't need spiky projections and in some cases you don't want spiky projections because if you're hitting a soft target you don't want your weapon entering that person's body and getting stuck in there and getting lodged so in that kind of context in a in a 17th century 
environment, a smooth hammer face, and particularly when it's such a small hammer face as well. Polax um, faces tend to be much bigger than this, at least twice as big usually. Um, so a small surface area, you don't really want spiky projections because then all you end up with is another spike. Okay, so if you want contrasting options, you want flat and spike. You don't want two spikes. So that's the first question. Next question, is this a belt hook? Yes, it's a belt hook. Okay, I kind of explained that, but I maybe didn't explain it in a very um, concise <laughs> way. Um, but yes, that is a belt hook, and that could be worn on your belt, obviously, or it could indeed be worn on the horse's saddle bow, um, which I believe is probably where these were often uh, worn, but who knows. Again, it's not something I've greatly researched. Next question that came up was about the roundness of the handle. Um, is, that, is that a problem in edge alignment, or in this case, spike and hammer alignment? Um, Kind of, yes, a bit, but not that much. The thing with swords is that, if I just grab a sword off the um, wall, what's a good example? I actually don't have a good example for hand now that I go to do this. Would you believe in a room full of swords, I can't find a good example. I'm trying to find an example which doesn't have a hilt that sticks out on one side. Anyway, I can't see one to, to hand. They've all got hilts on them that I can see. But a sword is able to revolve around this isn't, incidentally, because it's got a more or less flat grip, but if this had a round grip, it's able to revolve around its axis because it doesn't have any projections in either direction, like an axe or like a, like a warhammer does. Okay, so you can't actually really feel it turning in the hand unless you have a relatively flat grip, and you'll notice that the grip is wide that way and flat that way, as a good sword grip should be. And this gives you edge alignment. But this is something quite particular to swords, um, and that's not to say that that's not to say that edge alignment isn't a useful thing to be able to do with pole weapons. I've mentioned many times in the past that pole weapons that are designed to cut and thrust, such as halberds, bills, partisans, things like this, they often either have an octagonal shaft, sometimes a rectangular shaft, or sometimes an oval shaft to aid with edge alignment. That is true. However, with those, they're very long, and in actual fact, it can sometimes be difficult to feel which direction your edges or your points are pointing in. With a weapon like this, it seems to be less of, an, of, a, of a problem, um, because, because it's shorter and um, the, the head makes up a proportionately heavier amount of the total mass. You do seem to be able to get the, you know, without even looking, I can kind of feel, and despite the fact this is a cylindrical grip, I can kind of feel that the, my point is pointing in the right direction. If I spin it around, I can't, oh, it turns out I can. Okay, so that's an interesting thing there. It shows that with a, um, without even looking, I can, I can sort of turn the weapon around and sort of feel, no, that's wrong, okay. This is interesting. This is an interesting experiment and I didn't plan to do this. So if I if I look at it for a second, then I can get the I can get the point and the, the hammer aligned very, very quickly. But if I don't look, yeah, not bad. Okay. So it's an interesting experiment. I haven't uh, I haven't in depth studied the original handles on these, but I have looked at some 15th century examples, and in those, to me, it seems clear that the handles are in fact cylindrical, that they're not oval uh, or this kind of, you know, edge-defining shape. Um, is it a problem with alignment? I don't really know. Uh, it's surprising, it's surprising how quick and easy it is to shift this thing around, but you have to remember that someone using these would have a helmet on, so that does restrict your vision to some extent. Even if it's a Bergenat, which really only comes down the sides here, then, um, then you lose some of your peripheral vision. But if it's a, a visored, like a close helmet or something like this, that could conceivably still be used in the 17th century, then, um, then actually you might not be able to necessarily look at your weapon at the moment that you change orientation of it. But you can sort of feel it in your hand, uh, which direction, certainly which direction the long point is um, pointing in. And I suppose this is the point I wanted to make, is that if you have a cylindrical grip, it's not so much of a problem if you have one blade or, or um, appendage, should we say, which sticks out particularly in one direction. It tends to align itself more easily. So it seems to be less of a problem with axes and tomahawks and warhammers uh, than with things which are balanced on each side and therefore you can't really feel when you turn them so much. 
So there's my idea, the ideas on that. Um, next question that came up was, is this particular one with a twisted, there we go, with a twisted shaft, is it made out of one piece or several, uh, or two, or four, um, twisted together, or is it made out of one piece and then that decoration is carved in? That's the first question, and related to that, does that give any strength advantages? Well, the answer is I don't know. I'm having a look at it, and to me, it looks like it might have been forge welded out of four bars and twisted together and then forged into heat welded essentially so you heat it up to a temperature at which the the steel squishes together and kind of connects with itself like play-doh or plasticine would um, it looks like it's made out of four bars that have been twisted and then forge welded at each end but i would have to ask fabrice to be a hundred percent certain of that but that's what it looks like to me okay so that's my answer for now does that make it inherently any stronger than one which is made out of one bar well the short answer is i would say no however there is a caveat to that historical metal is different to modern metal so modern steel comes out of a factory and is what the victorians called cast steel that is it goes through the bessemer process of essentially melting it basically to get the impurities out out and then slowly solidifying it again um, so you end up with a very um, uh, a very a steel that's very uniform throughout and has the things that you don't want in it removed through a uh, industrial process in the medieval period and even in the 17th century they were not at that standard of technology yet and the steel essentially was um, was folded and forged, folded and forged as a way of getting out. So essentially you kind of work it, <laughs> spinning two, two watermers around, but you essentially work it um, so that you work out the impurities, but you do end up with impurities throughout the metal anyway, such as slag, okay? And slag is essentially crusty stuff uh, that's a byproduct of, of uh, smelting metal and you end up with it stuck as little inclusions so if you imagine like a biscuit for example or, or um, imagine uh, you know like, well, you, let's use the play-doh or plasticine analogy so it's kind of like brand new play-doh that comes straight out of the pot which is nicely uniform that's like modern steel and then the steel that they were using was a bit like um, a play-doh that's been used by your kids for a while and has got little bits and pieces of stuff off the table that have got squished into it and the slag and those other inclusions are like the bits of the bits of stuff in the in the play-doh um, and so naturally when you're talking about something like steel when you've got those inclusions of other things in the steel it's not going to be as um, inherently strong as something which is of uniform material all the way through because the slag is not as strong uh, it doesn't have a tensile strength equal to the material around it so it's going to be a weak spot when you make something out of bars like this and twist it to an extent you could argue that it's a bit like pattern welding and what you're doing is you're creating a structure whereby any weaknesses in the material are supported by this kind of cable type structure that you're creating so to come back around full uh, full circle i would say with a modern steel there's no inherent strength to pattern welding or indeed making a steel bar uh, cable that's twisted like this compared to one solid bar. However, historically, where you're dealing with steels which might not be um, homogenous all the way through, um, within those, there might be some benefits to obviously pattern welding or indeed creating a bar. One thing I would note as well, I don't know if the camera's gonna be uh, compliant and focus well enough, but I'll do that. You might be able to see that this steel used in the hammerhead here has got all sorts of irregularities in it all the way along there. And what those are, are in fact what I was just talking about. This is, I believe, historical uh, wrought iron and it's been made in a very traditional way using uh, an, old, um, an old piece of um, iron or steel um, so that it does have those types of slag inclusions and this is what steel often would have looked like 
in historical periods before the 19th century, it often would have looked like that with these kind of dark marks kind of scattered through it. Um, and that's not artificial aging or anything like that. I'll see if I can show you the top as well. Hold on. There we go. Um, that's actually, there we go. You can actually see it's got these almost like what look like blemishes in the steel and those are the those are the foreign inclusions in the iron essentially remember that the difference between iron and steel is only a matter of carbon content so if you increase the carbon content of iron you get steel um, and in modern terms you get mild steel and then if you put even more carbon in you end up with carbon steel and once you've got enough carbon in it you're able to heat treat it by um, by hardening and qu uh, quenching in other words heating it up to I think it's about 800 900 degrees and then putting it in either oil or water some other kind of rapidly cooling liquid and that makes it hard and then you can temper it by then you heat it up to a certain temperature I think it's about 400 degrees and then let it cool slowly and then you end up with a spray so you can do all of these cool things with heating and cooling on steel you can't really do that on iron iron is always bendable malleable you can't make a spring not an effective spring out of iron but you can out of steel so in actual fact inclusions and um, other things in the iron aren't only bad it's not only bad or only good of course carbon is good if you're trying to make steel um, but what these inclusions are in historical steel are often undesirable there are other things like silicon and things that have little build-ups like little bits of crust um, like the bits of biscuits stuck in the play-doh the analogy that I used earlier so there we go. Oh, one last point that came up. So uh, a number of you, quite a number of you in fact, asked about the turn up part of the guard. Now you will notice that both of them on this one and this one, and I believe they're both inspired by originals, they both face the hitting plane. Okay, so they're both facing either to the back or the front, depending which you class as the back and the front. But you'll notice that on the, the, the really fancy ornate one, the turn-up is in line with the hammer, and on the other one, the turn-up is in line with the spike. Now, what are these for? I don't know. Uh, I have no idea whatsoever. My initial thought was that um, they were something to do, and this is based on my experience with um, 19th century swords, is they might be something to do with um, not hitting the person's body. So if you were wearing something in a belt hook, the turn up making it more comfortable if it was repeatedly kind of um, knocking against the side of your body but of course the turn up is on the wrong side for that to be the case if that's the belt hook then the turn up would have to be on the side of the flat either that flat or that flat okay so you'd expect the turn up to be here but in both these cases the turn up is in line with the spike side so it's not going to be it's not going to be banging against the person's body as they walk or the horse's body if it's hung from the saddle or anything like this well it is going to be banging against them but that turn up is not going to help with that situation so i would uh, turn to fabrice hopefully fabrice will post on this video and actually answer that question maybe he doesn't know it could be that fabrice is just copying the originals and he doesn't have the answer as I've done with cookery videos, I have said, nobody knows. Sometimes, nobody knows. There are some things with historical arms and armour where we simply don't have the answer. We know that something is a certain way, but we don't know why it's that way. That might fall into that category, or it might not. There might be people out there who know the answer, but I am not one of those people, unfortunately. So there we go. Another look at Fabrice Cogno's fantastic um, 17th century horseman's um, picks or, or warhammers, whatever you want to call them, um, and they are beautiful, beautiful things, very nice in the hand, very handy, they feel like proper weapons and they're both very traditionally made, uh, in, in, in many cases with Fabrice stuff, actually using traditional historical iron and steel as well with the uh, historically accurate inclusions. This is something that very few makers are doing. Um, so there, they, there we go, I've answered a few questions. Uh, if you do have more questions about them then feel free to post underneath and if they're interesting enough questions I might do yet another video about these things. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, 
You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.